And it says we're no longer live. Can anyone in the room? You're live and recording, it said it. Ah, it says now. It just told me hello. that I was no longer live. <laughs> so hello, everyone, and welcome to our plenary session. We can hello. see you all. Thank you so much for joining. Um, I'd like to welcome everyone and thank you. And of course, welcome Martha Louise of Norway. Thank you so much for talking to us. We're going to be, the plenary is called Women Cultivating Peace, but we're going to really be looking at the need um, to recognize the importance of women in leadership and the role that they can play in cultivating, promoting um, stable and lasting peace. Um, just to introduce um, Martha Louise to everyone, she is the only daughter and the eldest daughter of um, King Harald of Norway. And um, I learned this, something that um, I'd never heard of before. She renounced her appanage. It's actually a word everywhere. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Great. Yes. yeah. So that's the state allowed, uh, the state allotted allowance to um, second children, isn't it, of... Um, no, it's actually what, what the royal family receives from the state um, as payment for what they do. So that's how they, they are paid as their salary kind of as an upnash from the state that supports them. Yeah. yeah. So you renounced that um, and you are now a private businesswoman and an author. I have to say I do love the name of your book. Why what, I've got it written down somewhere. Why kings and queens don't wear crowns? I love that. Yeah, that's one of my books. I have several books actually. I have, I think I have seven books uh, come out, uh, mostly on spirituality and highly sensitive people. But two children books, one fairy tale book uh, where I ga gathered fairy tale from all over the world, and one book, um, like you mentioned, about why kings and queens don't wear crowns. Because every time I was out officially. Um, and I had my, my bouquet of flowers in my hand from, from wherever I was. And the moms would go, 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 take a picture with the princess. And the parent and the little kid would be like, where, where, where's the princess? Because it was only me without a crown and not a bald gown or whatever, you know. So they disappointed so many children <laughs> that I decided to write a book. <laughs> Why we don't wear crowns is because we wear the crown in our hearts instead these oh. days. I love that. I love that. Yeah. And, but the reason we were talking about the appanage and why I denounced it was that, um, when I was born, I was the first born in my family, but because I was a girl, um, traditionally at the time, uh, there were the male that were taking over and heir to the, being heir to the throne. Um, and therefore, uh, I wasn't heir to the throne. Um, but then we got a prime minister called Guru Harlem Brundtland during the 80s. And, um, and she was a prime minister for a very long time, uh, to the extent that children growing up at the time asked in Norway whether it was possible for men to be prime minister, <laughs> which is a bit of the other way around. And she was very, um, for equal rights and, um, women's rights, obviously. And so she questioned why I wasn't heir to the throne. And so that was a huge discussion at the time, which ended with that my grandfather saying that um, we can't take a horse out of the race when the race has already started, meaning that uh, my brother, Hawk and me, um, had already been grown up till we were like, I think this was when I was like around 15, um, with him being heir to the throne and me not. And therefore, it's better to keep it that way. But for the next generation, we changed it so that now from 1990, the, in the next generation, there's a, a woman, um, Ingrid, who's taking over, yeah, who's the heir to the throne. Um, but but in that process, I, I and with Guru Arlen Brundtland, she said, you know, you need to have an appanage like uh, the male part does in the family. And so I got an appanage of 16,000 uh, pounds, dollars around there, um, which is not a lot of money for a year uh, to survive on. And again, it's, which is basically a lot to do with, with women's um, empowerment these days, you know, because it's always that we go get the lower budget, we get low pay, um, we can't sometimes survive um, because we are, not that I can't survive, that's not what I'm saying, but in general, women get lower pay than men. Also in Norway, even though we're a very equal country and 
and very much um, in many ways liberated and women are looked upon as equal as men. Um, but so so when I when I came into my 20s, I was like, this isn't fair. Like if I want to thrive in my life, I have to be dependent on my father or marrying a rich man, um, which I didn't want to do neither, basically, <laughs> and, uh, and decided to um, denounce my my title, Her Royal Highness, and also denounce the appanage of $16,000 US dollars. And um and start earning my own money. And I think uh, that I must be one of the happiest people play, paying tax in my country, <laughs> although it's high. <laughs> because um, from that day, I've created my own um, space and uh, I'm an entrepreneur, serial entrepreneur, and been um, working for children and uh, getting their heritage with, with fairy tales and um, also having a spiritual center and that I've run for 12 years um, and and being an advocate for women all around the world and writing, writing books, um, being a speaker, talking about highly sensitive people, talking about women's rights, you know, like there's so many things doing. And I also have a platform for horses, a tech platform, um, which is the hub for horses in Norway, uh, where we were called Hest 360, Horse 360, which which covers horse, basically, all genres, horse, and all the different areas of horse um, from A to Z, from beginner to professional. So it's, uh, and that's very fun and amazing too. Yeah, that, that's really interesting to hear. And I, I just was wondering if we could look at um, what we're all experiencing at the moment and if you could look at that through the lens of coming from what many would look at Norway and see it as an enlightened society, but what you're talking about only happened in the 1990s, right? So you have been in a patriarchal system your entire life. Um, I was just having a look at how specifically the pandemic has affected women. Um, and I just wanted to, to get your thoughts on that. If we look at jobs, you know, the KPMG say that progress for women in work has gone back to 2017 levels because of COVID-19. Um, in 17 of the 24 OECD countries, there's been an overall increase in unemployment in 2020. Jobs in the US, more than 5 million women's jobs were lost between the start of the pandemic and November 2020. So who knows what that number is now. Um, so that's jobs, violence. UN Women says that globally, even before the pandemic, one in three women experienced physical or sexual violence, mostly by an intimate partner. Um, education, I think we'll get to that a bit later. But I'd just like to get your reflections on how badly the pandemic has, well, how it initially affected women and continues today. Well, you know, like, firstly, I want to say that... Um the pandemic, of course, has hit uh, women because, again, um, we are not valid the same as men are, and therefore we are let off at work uh, easier than men, um, where men have the main jobs, we don't, you know, like, and, and, and that reflects that whole path that we're on. Saying that, though, also, the countries that have had female leaders have actually done better during the pandemic than the ones who haven't, which I find very interesting. And I think this is one of the traits where women really can um, can come forward and be the leader that they're supposed to be. Like, look at, at New Zealand's prime minister, for example, Ardern. She she open up Facebook, she was direct, she had direct information, open communication, she was very low key, but giving information that everybody needed, you know, of all direction, and they're the ones who've actually managed the best through this pandemic. Uh, Norway's done well, Germany's done well, you know, um, South Korea, it's women-led because I think there's a difference, and I think this is very important, there's a difference between men and women. Not necessarily that women are better than men or men better than women, but we are different. Because the masculine-feminine energy is different. Masculine energy goes out and it gets 
It's like an arrow going out, hitting a goal and getting there and bringing that in. Women, we are multidimensional beings who, who see things quantumly and we see the small details. We see how people are. We create communities. Um, we, we share with our community. We build, uh, when we, we thrive, we build together. And I think that that is shown because uh, of the effect that women leaders have had during this pandemic. Uh, and I think that's very interesting and wonderful that you can actually see that, that we're all going forward. We have to do this together. And that's a female energy that we have to do this together. And therefore, also, the women have thrived and the women have been listened to. And because that kind of energy is what we need. Now, normally, that kind of energy is looked down upon. But my inspiration has for many years been microfinance, which is when uh, a poor family gets a small loan to start a business. Now, if the woman then gets that loan, she will bring it back to the family, she will work, she will pay back the loan, then she will um, have money go into the educational system, she will support the local community, she will build with that money. And, and when that can happen in microfinance, that can happen on a global scale too. And I think we underestimate women's power in this field because we have looked down upon women being in their homes um, with the kids, uh, you know, creating that atmosphere of a community that has been downgraded because money has been a, an issue of success and uh, you know, success in business, success out there. You have to uh, be on the ball all the time. And it's been mainly ma um masculine uh, domination right so uh, so when women come in and this is very interesting for example when the uh, when the um, um what's that called when the boogies or the carts for the kids you know were babies in the crates oh, prams prams that's it yes when the prams were made they were made you know and they were made without breaks because it was a functional thing and this is how men think it's functional. Let's build this thing. And then that's it. But there were no breaks. So that was dangerous. So when the women came in, they got breaks. They got things to hang things on underneath to put things in, you know, and that's how we need to build our world. We need to build it together so that the masculine energy is supported by the women, uh, the female energy uh, and the creativity um, and vice versa, because we can't do it without the men either. And I think uh, the reason why it's important to have women leadership and women in all dimensions and areas of life and in the hierarchy is that you get that other perspective, the perspective that might surpass the men, that they might not get. Uh, and to see that quantum thing, oh, are you okay? Like, oh, I see there's a danger over there, that's there. You know, like we go into a room and we see, um, you know, oh, that's a bit old. Okay, this is new, that's there. Okay, where where are the hazards here in this room? Where, are, you know, like we have that because we have that in us as mothers to protect our kids. So it's instinct. And, um, and men don't see that it in that way. And I also find that another aspect of this is that when too, we need to lean more in. We need to understand that we are powerful, that we are important, uh, and that that view on the world is important for everybody. So therefore, we are important at the table as a decision maker uh, because we can point out things that the men can't. And I think it's, it's about time that we all start acknowledging each other for the, that cause, that we start working together. And it's not, I think it's important also to stress that um, we, as women, shouldn't be the same as men have been towards us for centuries, that we exclude the men um, and say, you know, where we know this, we know that, but that we include them and say, we can add to that. We can add this in your world and we can, together we can make it better. 
but we need both dimensions because we have both dimensions within us. So really it starts within us too, because the, the female energy is the receiving, it's the creative, it's the one who listens, right? And we need to listen and dream so that the dreams that come in as creativity can be executed into the world with the masculine energy. So within us, we need both um, feminine and masculine energy to create something in the world. And that's the whole thing with women being a decision maker too. You need that balance between the two. Um, yeah. It's very interesting you talk of that, of the different approaches between men and women. And if we look at the approaches to the pandemic, a lot of the um, uh, discussion about how different countries have approached it, you know, a lot of countries went with, okay, we're going to look at this as if we're fighting a war. So, you know, we've got to fight this, keep going. Here in the UK, it was keep calm and carry on, which is something that came from um, World War II. But then if you look at New Zealand, um, Jacinda Ardern, they went in mid-March, they went into one of the heaviest lockdowns, and she urged New Zealanders to be kind to one another. Um, check on your neighbours, call your grandma. And there was a very different... Uh, attitude to the pandemic and it was very much listen we're all in this together we're all it's not that we're fighting anything we just have to be together as a community to combat the disease exactly and I think that is the forte of women that were in this together because we see this world as a community and we see it more as a whole than small parts uh, where where we need to exist and and to thrive ourselves and I also think that that's where the world is going now. And what one of the things that the pandemic has shown us is that um, we have to go from the I, that I need to earn money, I need to have success, I need to do this, into a we need to do this together. And I think many people were surprised of how dependent we were on each other when the pandemic hit and how quickly the whole world ground to a halt. And, and I think that is a huge lesson for all of us that is not me, it's us. And I think that is very important information moving forward, that we need to all work together to thrive. So do you think that in order for things to change, for there to be change, it's up to each one of us to be the change in our day-to-day -day lives or do we need systemic change and how do we go about that on a, a national scale or on an international scale? I think we need change from all angles right now, to be honest. I think we need change um, from our, the depth within us, um, you know, as, as, as human beings of the game and we need to look within, let go of a lot of old patterns that we're holding on to of how the world is supposed to be. And I think we need to move into, uh, like I said, from the I dimension to the we, where we're all in close each other and and we, we grow together. I think that's possible and we need to thrive together. Um, on, on the whole, I think that there are a lot of things that need to change. I think, for example, the school system is very old fashioned compared to the world they actually come out into. Um, it's a huge gap between the crea creative mind that is actually needed in the world today where you can switch very quickly from one thing to another because things change so quickly um, on the tech tech platforms, then you need to be on the ball all the time. You have to be creative with the solutions. You have to think outside the box all the time to adapt. And the structures adapted work. Everything changes very rapidly. And, and people need a new global awareness. We've seen that the world is very small. Here on this meeting, we have a conference. We have people from all over the world, you know, together. And so it's so important that, that we see that and, and, and master that trait, I think, uh, of, of seeing each other and accepting each other and loving each other the way we are um, as well, as a community and as a world. I think that's very, very important. And the school system today is based on 
um, the old paradigm where it was important to just do what what your um, boss said basically and just say yes and I'll do that and keep on working and doing your job and then eventually you will get to the top of the of the scale but but today it's not like that um, and if you teach people and children today who will grow into young people just to follow that that um, and not question authorities, um, that's a problem, I think, because we don't, there's so much creativity in the young people of today in a total different way than at least.